and greetings from Panama. Oh, little baby pineapple. No, it's on the wheel. A Caribbean paradise and home to my weird creature, the pygmy sloth. A new species which was only classified by science in 2001. This is sloth breaking news. But this family of animals provoked an extraordinary reaction from one very eminent 18th century biologist. Count Georges Leclerc Buffon had this to say about the sloth. We should speak more of wretchedness than laziness, deprivation or defect in constitution. Their legs, they're too short, badly turned and badly terminated. These sloths are the lowest form of existence in the order of animals with flesh and blood. One more defect would make that existence impossible. It's clear that Georges didn't get sloths very much, and it's a shame because if you could see past his prejudice, he would have found a fascinated and highly specialised animal. And that is what this show is all about. I'm on the island of Colón on the Boca de Toro, a group of islands on the northern west end of Panama where I'm going to begin my quest for the pygmy sloth. In order to show you just how special a pygmy sloth is, we've got to first find you a regular sloth in order to compare and contrast. And uh, that's what we're trying to do right now. On our shopping list this morning are two species. In order to compare the two different branches of sloth life, the two-toed and the three-toed sloth. So once we've got that out of the way and we've shown you the regular sloth, then we're going to really push the boat out, quite literally, and head out to Escudos to uh, see if we can find the pygmy sloth. Let me introduce you to our young and annoyingly agile expert, Bryson Voiron. What a ridiculous name. Yeah, yeah. I can't see it's got a pattern on its back. It's your binocular right here. Go ahead. Get your hands on my binoculars. I've noticed this about you. You're going to have them away, aren't you? Yeah. Don't worry, I'll knock him into shape. They yeah. do have non non productive. Yeah. But I might have to work on my technique. Sure, just a younger male. It's a small one, actually. But he's already proving his worth and coming up with the goods. A two toed sloth. So I've got no idea what's going to happen, but we're going to try and get up there into the sloth's environment just to see it face to face if, of course, it stays there. By the way, I say sloth and sloth, they're interchangeable. It's just different ways of saying it. I'm surrounded by people who say sloth. I've always said sloth. Oh, goodness me, that is fantastic. <laughs> his front limbs are ready. It's straight up by his side. And if I was to make any kind of... <laughs> is that not a very, very cool animal? Do you know what? I didn't think I'd feel threatened by a sloth, but I am feeling quite threatened now. When you've got a mammal staring you out, knowing how sharp those uh, claws are, quite willing to lunge at you. It is a little disconcerting, to say the least. How many animals on this series have I had the time to savour like this? But this guy is just there, and I'm able, able to drink in his weirdness. And it is a very, very strange animal. You're going to get more than a look there, so I think. <laughs> Clearly, Comte de Buffon couldn't have witnessed any of this behaviour. Those claws literally hook over the branches just like a coat hanger, and he doesn't expend any energy doing so. Whilst I'm expending quite a lot, I'm sweating just holding my position here. Sloths are just brilliant at doing very little slowly. I'm looking at this animal and it's upside down, so the temptation is to do that and see a sloth from a sloth's point of view. And you know what? It looks just a little prettier. Well, that's the two-toed ticked off, but I want to find out more before I continue my quest. The American Museum of Natural History in New York is one of the greatest museums in the world and a place where I can come to find out more about the pygmy sloth. The man who can help me is curator of paleontology, Dr. John Flynn. If you mention sloth to anybody, it's a sort of derogatory term. They come up with an animal, it's just not very exciting. Right. 
Now, I know you're quite into your slows. What would you say to those people? It's nice to have a, a metabolic <laughs> word named after you, the slow movers, and uh, it's a very uh, good lifestyle for surviving on a uh, poor diet. But in fact, when you look at the group as a whole, even though there are very few living species, there are incredible diversity of forms that survived and thrived in South America uh, during a time when it was an island continent. This is a, what's called a ground sloth, and so the modern sloths just live in trees, and all of the species are arboreal. They uh, live in tropical forests. Um, they have a whole bunch of extinct relatives that roamed across the landscape in South America for tens of millions of years, and we're, we're among the most dominant and impressive of the plant eaters, the herbivores on that landscape, and they ranged in size from uh, small arboreal forms living in the trees to the giants that were uh, roaming down uh, across the landscape and ripping down trees. We can't possibly just ignore this thing here. Look at the difference there, compare and contrast. One of the things you have to realize about this is that this is the bony part of that claw. So in so this animal, what you've got is the fingernail coating, the actual claw that would be covering this thing would come huge. way out there. So this is a massive, gigantic claw. So which species this is? This one is one of the, the megatheres. So and how big is that animal? Uh, the that animals animal? can be as the megatherium itself is probably the largest, and that uh, could reach the size of a modern bull elephant. So four or five tons. These are massive animals. They can stand 16 or 17 feet tall at the, at the head when they're kind of tripoded up and kind of ripping down branches. So these were incredible animals and nothing, not one you'd mess around with. Yeah. So for the most part, these animals are pretty specialized herbivores. All the evidence that we have that's concrete from the fossils, the, the fossilized dung, the structures of the teeth, um, even some chemical analyses of the teeth suggest that they ate uh, just plant material and it's, uh, it's leaves, leaves, leaves. So let's add the giant ground sloth to the family tree. Now, I guess we don't have a, um, a, um, a, a, any pygmy sloth specimens here. No, and they've only been uh, recently discovered to science, in part because they were on an isolated island setting and uh, hadn't been explored for mammals. It's, it's really kind of a, a, an amazing thing how many species are out there remaining still to be discovered in, in environments that are hard to get to and, and tough to sample in. We know that already it's a, a rare and endangered taxon or species because um, it's in such a restricted uh, habitat. I guess to get the essence of a sloth, you really got to see them kind of on your level. And if we're spending any amount of time watching these things, I well, guess it's that's... great thinking of seeing them in a mangrove, just a very different kind of habitat. That these one of the reasons you had so many species over their history was because of that specialization to unique environments. Having seen a two toed sloth, I'm really keen now to see a three toed one. And of course, my bright eyed sloth sleuth Bryson knows exactly where to look. Up. Ah, there's one. Right there. Uh, got one. A uh, male. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, oh, it's moving. It's... Let's... Let's have a little look, see what he's doing. Got a sloth. Got a three toed. And it's a mild because you can see that big patch on the it's back. It's an orange hourglass on his back, and that's actually an oil gland. And that's that scent. And they rub it on the trees, and the females smell that, and that's how they mark their territory. And, is it, is it obvious to a human nose? Can you smell it? Uh, it has a slight sweet odor to it, actually. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to the yeah. getting the opportunity to sniff a sloth. <laughs> Bryson mimics the call of a female sloth. Sounds a bit like a wolf whistle to me. <whistles> but it works. Brilliant. You're confusing a sloth. This is kind of like the two-toed sloth, but the weirdness button's been been whacked right up. See, I'm the sloth whisperer. To bring you mascara and lipstick. Oh. <laughs> so straight away, there's one of those sloths mist blown out of the water, oh, or out of the canopy in this case. The 18th century naturalist Comte de Buffon thought the sloth's badly turned legs as good as useless. Well, wrong again. He's gone from this tree into this tree. And he's over there now. That's quite a distance for an animal that's not supposed to move much. So, there we are. That's the two and the three toad slow ticked off. There's just the pygmy to add now. OK, this program's all about sloths, particularly the pygmy sloth. And it's very, very special and unique because it lives on an island. And this program's really about the bigger picture, which is something called island biogeography. 
And what that's about is the study of animals and plants that have found themselves isolated from other populations by being on an island. And funny things happen to animals on islands. To illustrate this idea, I'm going to use the local frog phenomenon as an example. Now, this here is the strawberry poison dart frog, or the blue jeans frog, as it's called in some parts of the world. Now, this is the variety that I've seen and very familiar with in Costa Rica. They look pretty much like this. A little bit smaller, don't have Made in China written on their belly, but essentially, that's what I'm looking for. However, here on the archipelago, something weird has been going on. Oh, my, that is just... That is beautiful. A pale orange variety. This little fella here, this one's almost yellow. This guy is unbelievable, look at that. Almost pinky. Different yet again, strikingly different, yet it's the same species. Bear in mind, they're just from one patch on one island. To really illustrate the phenomena that's occurring here, we need to visit some of the other islands. So, this is Salati. Oh, look at that exquisite little frog. How different is that? Aquacate for a little bit of blue. Ow, everything's spiky. A very smoky blue, freckled little frog. This is Pastoris Island, and here the frogs are apparently green. You ready? They are a green speckled frog, totally different again. Now, just the body shape is that of a strawberry poison dart frog, but everything else is different. Just look at that colour. There's somewhere between 15 and 30 varieties of this frog um, in all of its range. I have to say the diversity is incredible. And these are very small islands. They're not separated by a great amount of water, yet look what's happened to the frog populations living on top of them. They have all become very, very different, very unique. It just goes to show you what happens on some of these islands when these species are left to their own devices under their own particular selection pressures. They turn into, well, a selection of little froggy jewels. No one knows why it occurs, no one knows how it occurs, but also that's what makes this place so special. <laughs> Now, I'm not expecting to find multicolored sloths on the island, but it's size that's the issue for the pygmy, obviously. Why is it so small? Why is it only found on that one island? Well, that's been a really interesting question in evolution in general, because what you do see is in many different groups of mammals, when they get to isolated islands of varying scales, from tiny ones to continent-sized ones, as they evolve all kinds of unusual forms. But one of the things that does tend to happen is a process called island dwarfism. In the mammal world, you tend to have uh, the large herbivores tend to get smaller. So that in the sloth world, this would be an example of something that got to an island and evolved a, a a much smaller form. I'm assuming that to be small is of an advantage to these animals, so... Well, A, you need less food when you're small, and that's one advantage. So there's less food with. to go around on an island. Right, you can be a little more cryptic, so you're not as, as obvious to a predator. Reducing your body size through evolutionary time can be an advantage so that you can focus your metabolic energy on just the survival mode. It's time to head off to a scooter to look for the pygmy. After all, that's what this quest is all about. But I also want to prove how misled Buffon's thinking was about this family of animals. After seeing the two and three toed, I'm beginning to question the extent of Buffon's field research. Will what I see with the pygmy convince me further that he really didn't understand this animal much at all? It's quite exciting this. I'm following in the footsteps of Chris Columbus who discovered this island sometime around the beginning of the 1500s. It's very tiny, it's like 1.7 square miles of biological isolation. And that's why we're here, because everything on this island is just a little bit unique, a little bit special. It's isolated from the mainland by about 10 miles, and it's been that way for something like 8,900 years which is quite recent, really. However, the animals stranded on this island have done their own thing. They've developed in their own way, and that, of course, includes our pygmy sloth. 
So where's the hotel then? I think it's good seabirds here too. I've been informed that there's uh, the brown boobies nest here, which is always nice. I like, like seeing brown boobies. And um, and also, <laughs> did I just say that? I did, didn't I? <laughs> Look at these beaches. It's a tropical island paradise. It'd be a paradise if all you brought was your swimming trunks and your, and your suntan lotion. However, for a biologist, it's just, I can't wait, I want to get on the land. That's all right, isn't it? It's home for the next couple of days. Apart from the old fishermen, we'd be the only people on this island, so we've come prepared. Do you camp much? Do I? Yeah. I'm just very tent proud, which is quite different from having obsessive compulsive tendencies. What are you doing there? Oh, don't film me doing this. I can't believe... Right, very useful tent. That's a fan and brush. I'm embarrassed now. Just hope we don't get any serious storms, that's all, because I didn't bring any sand pegs with me. It's held up by... by luck. By bad luck, there goes the tan. But true to tropical form, before I've had time to get all my waterproofs, the sun breaks through and it's back to paradise. Phew. Well, the camp's all ready, the business side's all taken care of, now the fun starts. Um, we're now off to find the uh, pygmy sloth, which, well, apparently our best chance are in some mangroves just around the coast here. That's yeah. going to be our first mangrove area we're coming up upon. Okay. We're going to go right through there into the right. And how far into the island centre does it go? Uh, it goes almost all the way through the island, actually. Wow. Yeah. I love mangroves because it's kind of this interface between the ocean and the terrestrial world. I mean, you've got trees that can tolerate salt water. And straight away, right there, is where the, the magic starts to occur. Now I've got Bryson captive in the boat, it gives me an opportunity to find out more about his work, which I've heard is pretty unique amongst sloth experts. What can you learn about life in general by studying the sloth? Lots of things, actually. One of our big studies right now is studying sleep in sloths, but in the wild. And no one ever really has studied sleep in the wild on any animal before we did it with the sloth. They were, we recorded some uh, sloth sleep back in the 80s on captive sloths, and they found they sleep 19, 20 hours a day. Very slothful. That's kind of their name was true. We did a study in the wild with 20 sloths and found they sleep about nine hours a day. So nowhere near as much as they thought. So they're actually not sleeping that much. So they are awake and they're aware. More evidence to poo-poo Buffon's theory. This weird creature is only slothful by name. Incredible to me when we think about, you know, this was cut off so recently. I mean, 9,000 years or 8,900, 8, I believe, is the official figure, but to be cut off from the mainland it isn't that long. No. Yet, and it's just difficult to think all these species have been turning over independently of anything else on any of the other islands or on the mainland. You know, there's a hummingbird here which is a massive controversy among the birders, whether or not it's a, um, is the escudo hummingbird or whether it's a chestnut rump tail hummingbird, I believe. It's one of the things that's special about escudo sloths here is that they're very calm, they're very tame compared to other sloths. When you get close to them, they're not afraid of you. They don't have any natural predators, so they are tame. It's almost like the marine iguanas and the Galapagos. They're, they're, they don't know what we are. They're not afraid of us. So what Bryson's saying could mean that my meeting with a pygmy sloth might be as close, if not closer, than my encounter with that two-toad. Oh, well, there is, there is that uh, controversial hummingbird. Mm. Look at that. Yeah, right there. See, if that was on the mainland, you'd say, oh, it's a chestnut rumped hummingbird, yep. and uh, there it goes. There it goes. <laughs> so, you didn't try and film that, did you? <laughs> Silly boy. Far too fast. They're ridiculous. Hummingbirds are difficult to see through binoculars, they don't film. Gradually, it becomes too shallow to go any further by boat. So, we have to wade, climb and clamber through the mangroves on foot. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant habitat. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. Everything a boy wants, it's got mud and trees. 
Oh, I seem to have found another hole. Bryson must have webbed feet, that's all I can say. Whoa! The mangrove tree crabs. Very, uh, very cool little denizen of the mangroves. Just look at that. We easily miss all these little jewels. They're running about in the mangrove all around us. We're so focused on sloths that we're not noticing these things. You see these things scurrying off, usually upwards into the mangrove trees. A surprising place um, for a crab, you might think. I love the way they hug the root. Look at that, it's like a clockwork toy. They make a noise if you listen around carefully though. Hear it? Any noise, aren't there? There's a mosquito in my left ear. No, no, listen. Right there. <laughs> this is the problem when you go out with a 24-year-old scientist, I'm afraid. He's got a lot of energy left in him. <laughs> Even with the tide out, still difficult to negotiate. But this is salt water that comes through here. And that's what these mangroves do so well. They trap this sediment and slowly but surely they, they reclaim the land for the island. Now, these roots are in mud, which is anaerobic. It's really nice. There's no oxygen down there at all. So in order to make up for that shortfall, um, they take it in via these roots. But when you get into the open channels, you get all the plant life, especially if you get the sun coming in. And that's where all the fish, all the marine fish, like to spawn. So these places really are essential to the uh, tropical ecosystems, particularly the oceans, because they are giant nurseries for all the fish that we love to eat. So they might seem disgusting places to be wading about on a day like this, but actually they've got an importance far beyond their appearance. Well, another bit of the mangrove story is this. This is the seed of a mangrove. And look, it's, uh, it's a particularly strange shape. It's got this uh, the sort of dark end here, which is kind of heavy, and it's got the light end here with a little shoot at the end. And what happens is they get shed from the tree and this will now float around. When the tide comes in, they'll fl it'll float off. Now, more often than not, they get wedged within this complex of mangroves and simply root and carry on like this one down here. And that will then grow up and then grow the, the sort of the sideways arching aerial roots. Or sometimes they get washed right out with the tide onto the edge of the mangrove where they get lodged in the sand and they do the same thing and they grow in the sand and grow out in towards the sea. They're much more tolerant of the salt environment and uh, they are kind of, I guess, the pioneer plants. They're the ones that, that solidify and regain the land first so everything else can move in. But uh, I think they're lovely. It's a lovely sea. It's a very neat little device as well. You often see these things bobbing around as well in the estuary. Sometimes they do this, which is great. And there we are, a planted mangrove. Look at that. These are the orchids that I spotted. They're beautiful. This whole area, this whole area is permeated with the smell of these few flowers. And this is how most orchids grow here in the tropics. They're, they're epiphytes. That means they're, they're not parasites. They're growing up in the trees. They're not feeding on the trees, but they're, they're feeding up on the limbs. This one's just hanging on this branch here. You've got the aerial roots there, are trapping moisture and any goodies. Of course, there's loads of moss here as well. They're basically, there's all sorts of little things going on here. This mangrove is home to another layer of plants upon its surface. See a lot of these around as well. This is a bromeliad of some kind. This again is another one of those epiphytic plants. It's not a parasite, it's simply using the tree's structure to give it a stable platform in the light. And these, again, are like little ecosystems in their own right. They will add to what we call biodiversity. The more things you can have stacked upon things and things living in those things, the richer and more diverse the environment. You don't have to delve too deeply in this sort of habitat before you come across something with a pulse. A look at that. I won't take credit for this one. Bryce caught this one. Look at that. That's what I like about crabs. Epitomised in one individual there. It's just a tonka toy. Wonderful articulations. And then it's almost got a facial expression look. 
Now what you can't see there is that those eyes that are folded into those sockets very neatly actually pop up. Look at how similar it looks. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Something that uh, if you live in Europe or any temperate parts of the world you're not used to. Crabs are simply are outcompeted by, uh, by other creatures, mainly insects in those places. Some of the tropics are just a place of plenty. Everything shares everything. This is uh, a crab you'll often find scuttling on a, on a seafront lawn. It's yet another one of those wonderful residents of the mangrove. So we've got a little boa constrictor. It's only a youngster. I've seen a boa constrictor from this part of the world. So let's see if I can get in there without... Either way, I don't want to get nailed. Oh, just let him settle. Ow! Don't panic. It's not venomous. <laughs> After all that, don't get bitten by the snake. So this is a boa constrictor. It's often the, the snake that's been... Um, you often expect these to be monster snakes. They get a really bad reputation. It is a constrictor. The word boa constrictor is actually a Latin name. So most people say, oh, we don't like Latin names. It's too complicated. But actually, you probably already know that one. And uh, it's a very, 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 very lovely snake. And I'm going to let it go and risk getting nailed again. But look at that. Isn't that a lovely snake? I'll put him back up in his bromeliad. Oh, that's going to go down well then. Go on, go back up on your Bermudiad. Brilliant, that's my first Central American boa constrictor, right there. Slightly embarrassed, but very happy naturalist. The one thing you don't want to do in a mangrove forest is get caught in a storm on a rising tide. So it's back to camp for a bit of slightly damp, rather frustrating water spout watching. My fire's going out, my coffee's watered down, and I don't think it's going to be a good day for looking for sloths. Just get that feeling. But, as I've said before, the weather in the tropics is somewhat changeable. So, as the sky's clear, we're back on the hunt. Oh no, we're back to the tent. OK, the hunt. The tent. The sloth. The camp. OK, we're going to go even if it's slightly overcast, no matter what. So, pygmy sloths live in both mangrove and forests, according to young Bryson. Now, I've done my first foray into the former, but now I'm off to explore the latter. How come you're... Have I just taken the only deep bit? Until, of course, I realise I've taken the wrong path. <laughs> Isn't it a trail? It's a river. Picture postcard. Panama seems a distant memory. Oh! <laughs> Is it possible to go off this place? I think so. You just love filming me when it's all going wrong, don't you? <laughs> Right, you ready? Yep. Oh. <laughs> I have nothing. I might as well swim on. Right, stay to the edge of the path. I think I've just demonstrated for you why it is that sloths stay in the trees around here. I think I've got a snake. I think. I'm going to call snake. I've got a snake. It's seen us. It's off. Can you see it? It looks just like a vine. Oh, you'll be better off going around that way, Si. You're looking for a brown thing that looks just like a vine. <laughs> but it isn't. Well, there he goes. Very, very well camouflaged and incredibly fast and hard to catch once they know that they're being hunted. Let me readjust my position on this slippery bank. Look, and that's a threat display. Uh, they do have, I believe, little fangs at the back of their mouth, which they use. They are venomous, but very mild venom. And what they do is they use those fangs um, 
to slow down their prey, usually frogs or anolis lizards, um, and they have a good old chew on them. These are beautifully lightweight snakes. Um, design here is obvious. They are able to go right to the very tips of all the branches, onto the tip of a fern, for example. The perfect place to find a, an anolis lizard or a little tree frog. Uh, sleeping during the day or during the nights. That's where animals tend to go for safety. The ruts are the very tips of the branches. So if you're a predator and you're after those animals, it makes sense if you can get there. See the gape? Look at that. It's all a bit of a bluff. This snake can't do me any damage. Look at that, displaying that real inky black mouth. It's a threat display designed to threaten can't really do any damage, it's far too delicate for that. But you don't want to take any chances, do you? I love these things, they remind me of, uh, of eels when I'm diving. Look at that, isn't it beautiful? I just love the shapes it throws its body into. The animal I want to talk about is just there. But I seem to have sunk in front of it. This is a very, very nice lizard. Um, uh, and one of the things it does very nicely is walk on water. It's also known as a Jesus Christ lizard. Some talent that I wish I had right now myself. It doesn't walk on water, it sprints on water. And the secret is in those back feet. Each one of those incredibly long toes has a little flap of scaled skin that runs along each side and it pushes back on the water surface as it does so that little flap of skin unfolds creating quite a lot of friction against the surface of the water and it does that incredibly fast so much so that it's able to generate a force and that, that should in theory support 110 percent of its body weight to me they look like the product of a, a movie maker's imagination Oh. They need to work on their definitions of footpath around here. I think the rain sadly has cost us. Right. Oh, hummingbird right on the ginger. Oh. <laughs> hummingbird to cameraman, Neil. Oh, it's becoming a bit of a joke, this, isn't it? It's a really difficult habitat to work this. No slurs today, but at least that proved just how much water is on this island. We've seen fresh, saline and slightly brackish water. Back at the holiday camp, though, entertainment is of the DIY variety. Luckily, I'm good at that. We're just going to a little look around. There's a little creek at the back of the, uh, the camp here, which I'm particularly interested in checking out. Came up. Quite easy to catch here. I hope it's not because they're completely under Mum's watchful eye. And that's a noise you don't want them to make, because that's calling Mum in. This is actually quite a young animal, and that croaking is a distress call, which will bring in mum. But look at that. Nice broad muzzle means it's able to take all manner of food, snails, fish, anything pretty much. But they're called spacicle caiman because they look like they're wearing spacicles. If you look between the eyes, this is like the, uh, the bridge of a pair of spacicles over the nose there. That's the easy way of recognising them. Oh, hang on. Now, watch this for a bit of over-enthusiasm. Yeah. I know what I'm going to do. I thought it was That's stupid. Now, I know this is a mud turtle of some kind, and I'm trying to work it out. It's got two hinges. The underside of the turtle's shell is, a, is called a plastron, and this guy's really neat. And when they're attacked, they shut. They squeeze their legs into the cavity, and if you're, if you're going to have a shell, let's have one that closes up totally. You see, it's much more advanced than any land-based tortoise. Um, oh, oh, that's not mum coming. So I can see another bit of red eye shine over there, which is how you spot a caiman bite. That's how I saw this guy before we got to it, but it's not moving towards me, so we're OK. I mean, one of the things that is going around in my head right now is that you know, these animals here are no doubt are very, very similar to ones on the mainland and probably haven't speciated at all. So what's so special about the frogs? They all have done their own thing. Our caiman and those turtles, no doubt, haven't. And that's what the magic of, of island biogeography and islandism um, 
is, and that's the fact that different animals, different species, undergo different changes at different rates for different reasons. And it is such a complex story. We don't know half the answers yet, but I guess that's what the fun of all this is. Gosh, little boy who dreamed this for me. I always dreamed of being able to run about a tropical stream at night catching spectacular reptiles. And now it's all come true. Just check in, see if there's any stuff. So from one boyhood dream to another, it's back to the boobies as we travel to the mangroves to continue looking for our pygmy sloth. Remember that uh, brown booby I so eloquently told you I like looking at earlier on? Well, there is one. That's the name the sailors gave them, but they're so stupid that they can approach them and club them and, and, and take them on board as food. There you have it, the first weird creature's gratuitous booby shot. Now we've just got to find a few other animals, including a sloth, of course. We rejoin the great sloth adventure back in the mangroves. Sloth watching will never make it as a live TV show, that's for sure. So, let me get to the good bit for you. Above us? Yeah, I'll leave this one right there. At last, my pygmy sloth. It looks like it's a female, although we can't really see from here. Uh, the bad news is he's at the top of a tree. So, what do you think we need to do? Okay, I'm not at my most enthusiastic here. I'm beginning to sound a little like Buffon. He's a miserable looking animal. He's so soggy. Let's carry on, see if we can find one that's a perfect height. Because um, the, the, basically the entire world's population of sloths, pygmy sloths anyway, are crammed in this small habitat you will see around you now. And, um, you know, it's all kind of, uh, you yeah, know, it's all lovely, it's all there, the thing doesn't run off. And then now we're looking for one that's easy enough to work with. I mean, that's just ludicrous. Have we got any idea how many there are here? As, and no one knows. About 100 is the, is the best. 100. 100, yeah. 100 animals in the entire population. Yeah. So that's why it's critically endangered. Yeah. Good grief. Right there's the incentive to find one. So for these 100 animals crammed into such a small habitat, you've got to wonder how secure this species actually is. Whilst looking for other sloths, I notice in this area that the mangrove is a little different. What's quite interesting is, you know, this habitat is the only habitat. You can pretty much see the entire range of this one species of animal in one view. And that's kind of scary, with estimates of around about 100 animals in existence. This is one of the rarest animals I've ever had the privilege of being in the presence of. But then look around us right now, we've got the sloth up there. Straight away you notice this bit of habitat's very different to what we've been clambering through, and that's because man's been here already. Look, look at that sawn off root there, and here, and here. It's all been cleared. And you can kind of imagine the knock-on effect. If you start removing the mangrove from this tiny little area, the only habitat of this mammal, it's going to cause a very quick knock-on uh, consequences. They can actually swim quite well between patches of mangrove. However, if there's nothing for the sloth to eat, you have no sloth. Or sloth, whatever. The more time I spend huffing and puffing through these mangroves and seeing sloth behaviour in the wild, I have to question whether or not Buffon drew his conclusions about this weird creature from the comfort of his armchair. Don't push me to the no, 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 no. They don't bear much relation to the reality. Faster, Bryson, faster. I told you I'd knock him into shape. We've been traipsing around in the swamp uh, for quite some time today, um, and this has been our best animal yet. As the tide is coming in, it's going to be quite hazardous for us to go out. I think we're going to try and at least gently bring this animal down so we can see it up close. So once again, Bryson's youthful vigour shows me up. Shinning up the mangrove trunks. Well, and then, there we go. finally... Oh, oh no, where's it gone? <laughs> Done. Right. There you are. Pygmy sloth, hard-earned pygmy sloth. But look at this guy. 
look at the green in his fur. This is the uh, kind of textbook thing about sloths that you'll always read about, which is this algae in their fur. So, what were Buffon's first impressions of a sloth? We should speak more of wretchedness. I'm presuming he must be referring to the algae. Is it in every sloth, this stuff? Not every sloth has sloth algae, but they all have specially developed hair that allows algae to live in the hair. So they actually have roofs or fissures in the hair, and the algae live in those fissures. So is this algae only found on sloths? Because that's the big, I guess that's the big question. Is it not just a slightly mouldy animal that spends all its time in the trees? As far as we know, we've never been able to find this algae anywhere but on the back of a sloth. And what's really cool is the two-toed and three-toed sloths both have algae, but they have different species of algae only found on their fur. We've never found it in a plant or in a tree or anywhere else in the wild. Wow, look at you. I can't believe I'm holding possibly the rarest animal on Earth. Look at that. You kind of feel sorry for it, don't you? Just, just for being a sloth, if nothing else. This, this whole way of being is what is makes them particularly peculiar to me. So we've got a belly, which is a quarter to a third of its body weight. The portly Comte de Buffon claimed the sloth had a defect in its constitution. Seems he was wrong again. So a lot of its body mass is put aside for digesting. The trees in the forest, the leaves, they're everywhere. Most of them are nasty, most of them are fairly leathery, most of them are full of toxins. Our sloth, by being a, a walking fermentation tank, has specialised itself to such an extent it's had to compromise all the other things. It's not a solid, feisty animal. It feels kind of flimsy. And that's possibly because only a quarter of its body weight is muscle. Now, muscle is very expensive. If you've got a lot of muscle, you use up a lot of energy. And also, it's incredibly heavy. So if you're an arboreal animal like a sloth, it means that uh, you're not going to get to the thin twigs at the ends of the branches very easily if you're heavy. So that's why it is so slow and steady and deliberate and seemingly indolent with its, uh, its movements. It's because it simply can't go fast. It doesn't have the muscles to power it. So for lots of reasons, this animal has pretty much given up muscle in order to be able to eat otherwise nutritionally poor food. But that's what it's doing. It's exploiting a resource. It's what it's so good at. Buffon, you haven't got a badly turned leg to stand on. There's so much to say about this creature. I can't believe Buffon ever even handled one. Let's, um, how do you turn a sloth around when they're getting attached to your head? Oh, it's real short hair. Yeah. And it's orangey. And then the orange will change in variation between sloths. But that's the actual oil. And you can actually smell it a little bit. It's almost like a I can't believe cologne. I'm sniffing the rarest mammal on earth. I don't know what cologne you wear, but that... Oh, blimey. Yeah, it's musty, but I've never sniffed the rest of a sloth, so I can only take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just the most bizarre animal. We've seen our three-toed sloth on the mainland. How does this differ, really? First off, they're about 40% the size of a normal three-toed sloth on the mainland. But if you look at its face, the markings are a lot brighter. Its eye markings, it's almost like it's wearing a mask. And it has this sort of cap look right behind its ears yeah. where it looks like it's wearing somewhat of a, like a hat and when they first found the sloth they called it the monk sloth because it looks like a monk it looks like it's wearing the typical monk headwear they have the most variable and the lowest body temperature of any mammal on earth and some think because they're so dependent on the ambient temperature if the temperature drops enough they simply stop working so they don't digest so they go dormant effectively and can't start digesting until they warm up which also explains why they are so sluggish. All these things all played together mean that that sloth, that animal that we all kind of love to laugh at, is actually a serious bit of survival kit. By being as slow as possible, by reducing your muscle mass, by increasing your digestive system, you have pretty much got a creature perfect for making the most of probably the most plentiful resource in the forest, or in this case, the mangrove and that's leaves. We've only got to know these relatively recently. 2001, this animal was, was described to science. And in the meantime, very few people, well, other than Bryson, has really been here, haven't you? So it's, uh, it's really a whole story that needs to be unraveled. I love them. Seriously love them. Probably fair, fair enough to put you back, isn't it? And now the time has come to say goodbye to this rare and incredibly weird creature as it disappears into...
That's the slowest animal release I've ever done. <laughs> one of maybe a hundred of its kind. That's one percent of the population of this species. Then the icing on the cake for me. At last, our cameraman nails a shot of that elusive yes. Escudo hummingbird. I can tell you for nothing that this is what some people refer to as the Escudo hummingbird, an endemic species to this island. The less convinced just call it a slightly bigger rufous-tailed hummingbird. Now, fortunately, they're fairly varied in their habitat selection as far as hummingbirds go. So it's probably got a better future ahead of it than our sloth. So far in this program, I've seen two pygmy sloths and Bryson spotted the third. It's a great success for my quest, but a sobering thought that these represent 3% of the world's pygmy sloth population. Think about it this way. If I threw a party for the same percentage of the standard three-toed sloths, I'd be hanging out with way over 100,000 animals. The pygmy party, in comparison, would be pathetic, with just three guests. Which is what makes this last encounter all the more poignant for me. Before we let this lady go about her business, one thing I've learned is that whether you're a three-toed sloth, a two-toed sloth, or this, the incredibly rare pygmy three-toed sloth, you are a very weird creature indeed. It's a mind-blowing creature, really. This pot-bellied guru of the rainforest canopy is not that miscreant that uh, Buffon described, but an absolute specialist of a weird creature. When it comes to sloths, cop to Buffon, you're a buffoon. <laughs>